Wisdom of the Ages, 60 Days to Enlightenment. <laughs> if only it was that easy. Mm. The Six Mistakes of Man. This section is titled Triumph. The first mistake of man is the illusion that personal gain is made up of crushing others. The tendency to worry about things that cannot be changed or corrected. The third mistake of man is insisting that a thing is impossible because we cannot accomplish it. The fourth, refusing to set aside trivial preferences. The fifth, neglecting development and refinement of the mind and not acquiring the habit of reading and study. The sixth mistake of man, attempting to compel others to believe and live as we do. Hmm. Marcus Tullius Cicero. 106 B.C. to 43 B.C., Roman statesman and man of letters, Cicero was Rome's greatest orator and its most articulate philosopher. The last years of Republican Rome are often referred to as the age of Cicero. That's fascinating. It absolutely amazes me when I consider that over 2,000 years ago, our brilliant and persuasive ancestors were walking on the same soil we walk on, breathing the air that we breathe, and watching the same stars we view at night, and being awed by the same sun we see every day, speaking and writing of the identical concerns we all share today. Maybe some slightly different. <laughs> There's profound, wondrous connection to those people that thrills and mystifies me as I read what they were trying to tell their fellow citizens, and me as well. A citizen who just happens to have appeared on the same planet a couple thousand years later. Cicero was once called the father of his country. He was a brilliant orator, lawyer, statesman, writer, poet, critic, philosopher, who lived in the century before the birth of Christ and was momentously involved in all the conflicts between Pompey, Caesar, Brutus, and many of the other historical characters and events that make up the Roman history, make up ancient Roman history. He had a brilliant and long political career and was an established writer whose work was considered the most influential of its time. In those days, however, dissidents were not treated kindly. He was executed. Ah, in 43 B.C., his head and hands displayed on the speaker's platform at the Forum in Rome. What the heck? What the heck? Oh, man, that's probably a fascinating story. Too bad, huh? Just wild. In one of his most memorable treatises, Cicero outlined the six mistakes of man as he saw them evidenced in ancient Rome. Twenty centuries later, I repeat them here, as Wayne Dyer puts, with a brief commentary. We still can learn from our ancestors of antiquity, and I trust 
my corroborations of Cicero's six mistakes will not lead to my head and hands being displayed at our National Speakers Forum. <laughs> oh, so grateful for that. That today we can, um, at least for some things, we are free to share and speak of without fear of Man, anyways. Mistake number one. The illusion that personal gain is made up of crushing others. This is a problem that unfortunately is still with us today. Many people feel that they are able to elevate themselves in importance by finding fault with others. I recently watched an internationally successful motivational speaker being interviewed on television. His approach was, I am better than everyone else. No one else can provide the tools for living that I can. Don't listen to those who are only providing a pep talk. They're all inferior. I couldn't help but think of Cicero's number one mistake. There are two ways to have the tallest building in town. One way is to go around crushing everyone else's buildings. But this method seldom works for long because those having their buildings raised will eventually come back to haunt the crusher. Mmm. I've heard that used quite a few times and I've never heard it used that way. It's usually just the simple, there's two ways to have the tallest building tear everybody else's down till yours is the last standing. So it's automatically by default the tallest or build yours bigger. I've never heard it said this way though. One way is to go around crushing everyone else's buildings, but this method seldom works for long because those having their buildings raised will eventually come back to haunt the crusher. Hmm. The second way is to work on your own building and watch it grow. And so it is in politics, business, and our own individual lives. Mistake number two. The tendency to worry about things that cannot be changed or corrected. Apparently, people in the ancient world spent their energies worrying people in the ancient world. Apparently people right now, as we speak, or people in the ancient world, spent their energies worrying about things they had no control over. And little has changed since. One of my teachers put it to me quite succinctly. succinctly. <laughs> he said, first, it makes no sense to worry about the things you have no control over. Now, this is key to get here, because if you have no control over them, it makes no sense to worry about them. Second, it makes no sense to worry about the things you do have control over, because if you have control, it makes no sense to worry. <laughs> and there goes everything that it is possible to worry about. Either you have control or you don't, and either way, worry is a huge mistake. Mistake number three. Insisting that a thing is impossible because we cannot accomplish it. Many of us are still afflicted with this penchant for pessimism. So often, too often, we jump to the conclusion that something is impossible simply because we cannot see the solution. And I've heard many people tell me that angels, reincarnation, soul travel, communication with the deceased, travel to our distant galaxies, I added R in there, travel to distant galaxies, genetic surgery, time machines, travel at the speed of light, miraculous spontaneous healings, and so on are all impossibilities 
simply because they cannot conceive of such ideas. I wonder how many of Cicero's contemporaries could foresee telephones, fax machines, computers, and automobiles, airplanes, and missiles, electricity, running water, remote controls, walking on the moon? Hmm. 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 Um, we'll leave that there. And so many of the things we take for granted today, a good motto is, no one knows enough to be a pessimist. No one knows enough to be a pessimist. Do you know everything? Because context, context, context is key. And with context, there becomes a full understanding of the truth of reality, not just a particularized point of view or a subjective viewpoint. Sorry, got off on a tangent there. Dun, 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 dun. No one knows enough to be a pessimist. What we can't fathom today will be accepted reality of those who reside here 2,000 years into the future. Mistake number four. Refusing to set aside trivial preferences. So many of us, major and minor subjects as our way of life, we allow our precious life energies to be spent on worry about what others think of us, petty concerns about appearance or what labels we're wearing. We consume our lives in anguish over squabbles with family or co-workers, or we fill our conversations with drapery talk. <laughs> uh, he's always using the drapery. Earlier, he's talking about problems in a previous chapter, and He's referencing all kinds of problems in life, and he references drapery problems. I'm like, I wonder if he's had some problems with draperies. <laughs> uh, drapery talk. Ego becomes the driving force of our lives, with our self-importance persistently taking center stage. We see hunger and starvation on our planet, but become impatient when we must wait five extra minutes for a table in a restaurant. Mmm, isn't perspective making all the difference? <sighs> Where half the food will be discarded as garbage. That's a powerful. Read that sentence again. We see hunger and starvation on our planet, but become impatient when we must wait five extra minutes for a table in a restaurant where half the food will be discarded as garbage. We hear about children maimed and killed by guns and gunmen by the thousands, yet we accept it as a condition that we cannot do anything about. In our own personal lives, too many of us believe that we are unable to make a difference on the larger issues. So we immerse ourselves in our game of ego-sponsored trivial pursuit. pursuit. <clears throat> Mistake number five. Neglecting development and refining, sorry, neglecting development and refinement of the mind and not acquiring the habit of reading and study. It seems that when we finish our formal schooling, we have completed our development of the mind. We have adopted the credo of reading and studying for the purpose of taking the examination and earning our merit badge in the form of a diploma or advanced degree. Ironic for me. Once the certificate is in hand, the need to study and refine the mind is terminated. Even more ironic for me. I don't believe I've ever received a certificate, but yet, as I've grown, I've found myself drawn more and more 
to read and study and refine the mind. No certificates. I've gone the opposite way here. Cicero must have noticed this same tendency among his fellow Roman citizens and warned them that it could be a prelude to the downfall of their empire. And so it came to pass. Our lives are greatly enriched when we immerse ourselves in literature and spiritual writing, not because we are going to be tested, but purely for the sake of personal enrichment. You will find that daily reading and study provide you with a deeper and richer experience of life in all ways. This is particularly gratifying when you know that you are doing it out of the choice, out of choice, rather than as an assignment. This is an interesting area for me that I've thought a lot about lately, which is spiritual materialism. Doing spiritual acts in a materialistic way, like you're going to get something out of it. It's fascinating. It's a fascinating thought. Because wouldn't that defeat the purpose, maybe? Mistake number six is, is a good one. It's a good one. Do, 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 do. Hold on, I lost my place. You'll find a yeah, deeper and richer experience of life in all ways. Yes. Choice rather than as an assignment. Mm. Mistake number six. Attempting to compel others to believe and live as we do. Obviously, we are still guilty of this sixth mistake. Too often, we feel victimized by those who are imposing on us their views of what we should be doing and how we should be living. The result is a high state of tension and resentment. No one wants to be told how to live or what to do. One of the specific traits of highly functioning people is that they have no desire or investment in controlling other people. Being independent of the good opinion of others. We need to remind ourselves, ah, and also, sorry, got to cut in here, read that again. One of the specific traits of highly functioning people is that they have no desire or investment in controlling other people. They're independent of the good opinion of other people, and they're detached from outcomes. Hmm. We need to remind ourselves of this truth and take the advice of Voltaire in his last line. Learn to cultivate your own garden. Grow your own boat. <laughs> I have that. Learn to cultivate your own garden. If others want to grow cabbage and you choose to grow corn, then so be it. <laughs> Yet... There is this propensity to peer into the lives of others or peer into other people's gardens and insist that they believe and care in the same way as we do. It is a common mistake of families to impose their will on everyone else in the unit. It is also a common mistake of government officials who are determining what is best for everyone. If Cicero's six mistakes are an unwelcome part of your life, considering or consider the following six suggestions. Put your attention on your life and how to improve it. Catch yourself when you are engaged in the habit of verbally crushing others and stop instantly. The more you become aware of tearing down the building of others, the sooner you will shift to constructing your own tall building. Ask yourself, as you experience worry, can I do anything about this? If it is out of your control, then let it go. 
If there is anything you can do, then shift gears and work on the strategy. Hmm. These two questions will get you out of the worry habit. Number three. Anytime you confront a problem that you feel is impossible to solve, remind yourself that this is nothing more than a solution waiting for the right response. Wow. If you can't see the solution, begin the process of investigating who can. There is always someone who can see it from a possibility rather than an impossibility perspective. Remove impossible from your vocabulary entirely. Give yourself assignments to work on what you consider the most significant issues facing all of us. Give up some of your self-indulgent activities in favor of these greater tasks. And remind yourself that in some small way your contribution to the resol resolution of major social problems is making an impact. Sometimes, I'll add this, changing the world comes down to each one of us changing ourselves. Give yourself time every day to read spiritual books or listen to tapes in your spare time, maybe while driving. Make a habit of attending self-improvement seminars or lectures in your community on all sorts of mind-refining subjects. I find that that fifth one goes contrary to the sixth one, but that's the fun thing about the universe. It's all paradoxes. <laughs> Cultivate your own garden and let go of your tendency to examine and judge how others cultivate theirs. Catch yourself in moments of gossip about how others ought to be living and rid yourself of thoughts about how they should be doing it this way, or how they have no right to live and think as they do. Stay busy and involved in your own life's projects and pursuits, and you will be far too busy to care, much less compel others to believe and live as you do. Those are the six suggestions. From ancient Rome, Cicero, as the great statesman, orator, writer, philosopher, gives us all a lesson in living. Don't make these same mistakes that mankind has been making throughout the centuries. Instead, vow to eliminate them from your life, one day at a time. And begin living the wisdom of the ages. Seek to achieve the wisdom of the ages. Hmm. Beautiful. Hopefully that was, yep. That was the end of that chapter. The next one is called Being Childlike. Hmm. All right. Thank you very much. Hope you enjoyed. Hmm.